in studio with us, Bob Fleener, Jeopardy champion, former co-host on this program as well, all around uh, man about town. Good morning to you, Robert. Good morning, Rob. Mm -hmm. And uh, Casey Wilson via telephone. Casey, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Nice to be here. Great to have you. I uh, think, uh, what, I guess about a year, uh, usually around this time when we have the read aloud mm -hmm. uh, information on. So good to have you back with us again, Casey. And and Bob, and how many schools will you folks be doing the read aloud program in this year? Well, we hope for 22. That would be all of the uh, schools in Berkeley County, ranging from uh, pre-K through grade 5. Uh, as of yesterday afternoon, we had 17 of those schools committed for this year, and I know we're going to get a, a few more than that. So, uh, And then uh, some of the schools are already out there lining up teachers and recruiting readers for this year, which is why we're here today. Are you looking for more volunteers? We can always use more volunteers, yeah. yeah. Uh, COVID, like it did to just about everything else in society, really, really kicked our butt. Uh, we, the day before everything shut down, we were at our high watermark for this program in Berkeley County. We had close to 170 volunteers covering 230 classrooms in, uh, in about 20 or 21 schools. The next day, we were at zero. And we had to build from scratch because there was a year there, the rest of that year, and then the following year, the only people who could read the students were ones who were willing to tape themselves reading on video. And Casey did quite a few of those. And uh, we had uh, virtual sessions via Microsoft Teams where we would speak to the entire uh, classroom at once. But we had uh, maybe just a couple dozen readers doing that. Well, I tell you, and I tell you, Rob, uh, this year is more important than ever, so I'm really glad you're having us back on the air. It uh, really calls for a full-court press. With all that disruption, uh, the reading scores and math scores are as low as they've been in the last 20 years. So this is a real community full-court press to get our kids back up to speed and set them on the right track. Casey, how many years have you been doing this? Uh, I'm in my eighth year now. And I start with, uh, I read, I'm already back in the classroom with three classrooms. I'm doing pre-K, K, and one. And I have done second grade as well. And Bob does uh, four and five. So trying to get these kids in elementary school and get them to be motivated to pick up a book instead of a tablet or an iPad. How about you, Bob? Oh, gosh. I was recruited into this program by Marsha Dodson, who was uh, the chapter uh, president before me. I'd known Marsha since seventh grade. And uh, this was my post-retirement project. She said, you would be excellent getting into a classroom. So this was in, uh, this was in the spring of 2014. So actually, considering the end of that year and the beginning of this year, I'm entering my 11th school year as a read aloud volunteer and it's the it's the most fun re, the, the most rewarding experience i think i've ever had john when, when you guys go into the classrooms how long i mean how long do you spend i mean typically if you're reading to pre-k or kindergarten the books are pretty short i mean do you go in and read two or three books what how, how long how long do you guys spend well, well uh, it, it, go ahead Casey. go ahead bob oh well, i'll just say uh rob it does depend on the uh, age of the students when i go into a pre-k I'll, I'll go in and sit down at a table with them and engage in an activity, and then the teacher brings a book over and says, hey, kids, what do you think if he read you a book? And, you know, that could be 10 minutes uh, attention span. But when, when you're a volunteer, we ask you to count on a half an hour. And, again, with the younger kids, it may be shorter. I'll go into my classes, and as you just noted, Rob, uh, with picture books, uh, with kindergarten and first graders, I can do two books. Uh, and uh, try to keep them engaged and involved in the story with some back and forth interaction. So we ask our volunteers to count on a half an hour, and it's typically the same half hour on the same day every week. So you can schedule around it personally. And you get a relationship with the students as the year as the year go on. They get comfortable with you. You get comfortable with them. I think last year because we'd been a, because we'd been away from the classrooms for so long. And the students, I think, were more welcoming. They appreciated us more. Uh, leaving the classrooms every day, I'd get, I'd get hugs. Students would be handing me, handing me drawings. For instance, they'd want, to, they'd want to talk about the books. They missed the program, too. And um, 
I gave you the numbers pre-COVID. Last we finished last year, we had 84 volunteers. We were about halfway back mm-hmm. in terms of our in terms of our census. We were on 130 classrooms as opposed to 230. But the key statistic there, we had 50 more teachers in Berkeley County who wanted a read aloud volunteer, and we couldn't provide one for them. Mm-hmm. We just lost. We just lost a lot of volunteers. We've had a retention problem over the years. We would typically lose about twenty-five to thirty percent of our volunteers from one year to the next. They decided maybe, maybe they didn't like the program. They couldn't make the time commitment, or they'd have health issues, or they'd have job issues, or they would be following their child or grandchild through the grades, and then this, then the child would age out. So we were always in the need of new volunteers, and and it's particularly. Uh, situations particularly dire now first of all i want to talk to our uh, people who have been read aloud volunteers over the years we would love to have you back so go to uh, readaloudwv.org you can get my contact information there talk to me we'll get you we'll get you back to a classroom this year and uh, then i think well we're going to give you these dates and times a couple different places but we do have some new reader orientation sessions that are set up in the uh, in the near future. Uh, Casey, you want me to give them these, or do you have those in front of you? Why don't you go ahead, Bob, and give them the uh, dates and times for the virtual ones, okay. as well as an in-person orientation again. Yeah, for the first time in a couple of years. Right, we've got uh, w- w- we're doing some statewide ones via Zoom. The the first one will be this Thursday, September seventh, at four p.m. Then the following day, September 8th at 12.30 p.m., and Casey will be the uh, facilitator on those. Uh, Then two weeks later, September 21st, the Thursday at 4 p.m., September 22nd, the Friday at 12.30 p.m., then you can go to readaloudwv.org slash calendar, and then you could uh, pre-register for those events. Now, for the first time since the Tuesday before the COVID shutdown, we are actually going to have some in-person events where people people can show up, and if they're interested in the program, Casey and I will be talking to them about it. Uh, you can you can register. You can let us know what your preferred schools are, your preferred grade levels are, the preferred days and times of the week that you'd be able to read. The first one of those will be a week from tomorrow, September 13th at the Berkeley Senior Center on uh, on High Street in Martinsburg. That'll start at 10:30 a.m. and that'll last for about an hour and a half. Two weeks after that, we're going to be at the Tuscarora Elementary School Library. That's September 27th, a Wednesday at 6 p.m. And we typically over the years have had some outstanding turnout there. So I just want to relate something, Bob, from uh, some folks who have done read aloud in our audience. Damon Wright said kindergarten was about 10 to 15 minutes. Second grade was about 20 to 25. Read four or five books. Hold on a second. I just jumped. Uh, for second grade and kindergarten, just two books, all related to that week's month or uh, week or month's lesson. Mm. And then a uh, question from Jeff Haddix uh, for you, Casey and Bob. Who picks the books that you're supposed to read? Oh, that's a great question. You pick the books uh, that you want to read. And one of the keys to being motivational is to pick a book that you like. Uh, that's one of the unusual things about the volunteer presence in the classroom is it's a book picked by another adult that comes in with the teacher's uh, permission, of course. Thank you. We, we run the books by uh, the teachers. But you get to pick your own books. And I'd never had kids, and I was all fired up for the program, and then I learned I had to pick my own books and freaked out a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because what's, what's appropriate? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And uh, some of the things we cover in the training – by the way, Rob, I just mentioned – that when you come to these orientation se- sessions, we're not teaching you to read. We'll give you some tips, but we're really making yeah. sure that all the read aloud readers that go into a classroom in this day and age are oriented to, towards school security, etiquette, protocol, and then of course we focus on book selection and reading tips in that orientation. And you only have to do it once. Once you do one of those uh, orientation sessions, you're good to go for as long as you want to read to kids. Well, both you and Bob are very intelligent, so I would suspect that you would have to make sure you understand who you're reading to when you go in there. Well, sure. Absolutely. You, 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 take that, you take that into account, age appropriateness. But uh, Casey has always made an excellent point about uh, how students, their listening vocabulary is higher 
perhaps in their reading and writing vocabulary. Sure. They're going to be mm-hmm. able to understand some things in context. So you can uh, so you can you can stretch it a little, but you don't want to stretch it too much. You want to keep the kids interested. Mm-hmm. In my case, I have a repertoire of about forty books. They're all they're all chapter books. I like to leave a little cliffhanger <laughs> at the end of every session to leave them wanting more. And a true uh, showman. I will. And I will float that list to the teachers. I'll be reading in four classes this year, two at uh, Mill Creek Intermediate and uh, two at Orchard View Intermediate. And I'll present these to the teachers to say, hey, if you object to any of these, let me know. If you're planning to teach these books, because in many cases, these books might be part of their curriculum. You know, let me know that as well. And then what I'll do, I'll give the, uh, I'll give the students a list of three or four titles they vote. They tell me what they want to hear. And then you read the whole book during the school and I'll, year? I'll read the, I'll read the book during the school year. Generally, um, the books I read can be covered in a span of either a month up to maybe three months. I can, so I can read about four chapter books over the course of the year. Matt Miller. So when you talk about choosing books and you may not have – a good idea of what books to choose do you just reach out to the teacher at that point and find out what they're going through and and what their suggestions may be oh rob the first stop at least for me the first stop was the school library and okay. the librarian uh and that way i could cover a couple of different classes with her and see what they were offering and what her uh perception of what students like to read on their own is and that was uh, very valuable. And I'll tell you, Rob, my neighbors turned out in force. Uh, when I went into my first classroom, I had books from uh, my neighbors who were excited that I was going to read to younger kids, and they provided me with books that their kids had liked. Uh, and, of course, the library is the first stop, teacher, your neighbors, uh, even your family. I, I, and I have a closet full of books now from all sorts of sources it's it's really a pleasure and it's and it's amazing the stories are timeless i mean the the children of today are going to love misty of chincoteague old yeller um titles like that that have stood the test of time because they're new to the students and the stories are still wonderful they hold up but over the course of this i I, like casey i've never had children i missed a half century of kitty lit when i joined this program (laughs) So I've been introduced with some wonderful new voices, Dan Gemeinhart, Dan Gutman, uh, Christopher Paul Curtis, and then um, books that I had missed by um, Kate DiCamillo, some of the wonderful authors who are working in that genre right now. And it's, uh, uh, it's fascinating because I'm learning every day. You mentioned uh, hearing and, and learning some new voices. How much do you kind of add voices and bring the reading to life uh, for the kids? Okay, well, go ahead, Casey. Rob, Rob, real quick, Bob. Rob, you noted about being a showman. Bob is a ham actor. <laughs> he has brought me to tears in an orientation where he reads a section of a couple of dramatic books. Uh, 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 Bob really does an awesome job with chapter books. Uh, and when my, my venue is an entirely different venue, it's showbiz. I mean, I've got pictures in the books, uh, get the kids engaged. It's a younger crowd. But the key is to be yourself, uh, to read with enthusiasm. Uh, we do have readers that can do cartoon voices and do all sorts of things. But if you're not a ham actor... And if you don't have that skill of doing a lot of voices, just go in and read with enthusiasm and sincerity, and the kids will pick it right up. Uh, You know, be yourself. Uh, Never underestimate the kids. They can tell if you're trying to fake something. Uh, (laughs) And one of the things that we emphasize is that a, a bad reader is worse than no reader. So we, uh, we, we stress during our orientation sessions that you practice reading aloud at least three times before you take that selection into a classroom. And when you find out you do that, of course, you're more comfortable with material and you know the points of emphasis. Um, you're also more comfortable with it. So when you go into that classroom, you can make eye contact over the course of that period with every kid in that room to draw them in. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, the, the emphasis is very important. Yes, it is. When you're reading. Yeah. The emphasis is emphasis. Yes. Uh, emphasis is too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you use uh, Casey or Bob or any of your readers use visual aids as well? I will. Uh, when I read Are You a Bee, I will wear a, uh, a veil and a hat and bee gloves and accuse the kids of being bees, which is always gets a lot of them. Uh, when I do hats, for, when I was videotaping, I'd use all sorts of stuff. Uh, for instance, with hats for sale, which is a 50-year-old story, at the end, the monkeys dumped the hats on uh, uh, the vendor, and so my wife stood off camera and dumped a box of hats on me. <laughs> I, uh, I usually take something that's relevant to the story, if I have something. I use uh, Christmas sleigh bells. I use a train whistle. I use uh, an egg that, that shakes like a little musical instrument. Uh, things like that, uh, that if it's relevant to the story, the kids get a kick out of. How about you, Bob? Uh, when I read from the uh, Dan Gutman series, The Baseball Card Adventures, which is about a 12-year-old kid from Louisville who can travel through time using baseball cards. And he usually goes back to try to fix something that was wrong in the past. For instance, in... Uh, Shoeless Joe and me. He goes back to nineteen. He goes back to nineteen eighteen to try to stop the World Series from being thrown. He's not able to do that, but he's able to save the life of his great uncle, who was going to die from the flu epidemic. But Joe happened to have an antibiotic in his pocket. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> but nice. things like that. Uh, Mickey and me, where he goes back in time to warn Mickey Mantle not to trip on that drain pipe in uh, oh, right yeah. center field at Yankee oh, yeah. Stadium to mess up his to mess up his career. That doesn't go as, as planned either. But anyway, when I read those books, I will, bring, I will actually give baseball cards to the kids. In many cases, they've never seen one before. Did you give away your Mickey Mantle card to the kids? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> my, one of my best, my, my, my 1961 Mickey was pasted into my Cub Scout scrapbook by my mom along with, Will, along with Willie Mays. You know, I should have finished that scrapbook by myself. Yeah. <laughs> Six, 61 was the most beautiful set of Topps cards ever. 61 Three. was the best set. Yeah, I still have about three hundred of those. So yeah, I do too. Wow. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a couple hundred sixty ones. Sixty one yeah. was perfect. Very nice. So, uh, Casey, uh, word out to any volunteers out there. What do you have to say? Listen, folks, the community needs a full court press to help our kids get motivated to read books. Uh, the the uh, impact of reading books as opposed to digital is significant. And the great thing about being a read aloud volunteer is we've got the best piece in the in the puzzle. The teachers teach reading, families need to demonstrate reading, but we go into the classroom as adults from the outside and demonstrate how fun it is, how enriching it is, and we motivate the readers. So be a read aloud volunteer. We've got the best piece in the puzzle of increasing the literacy of our children, which is the most important tool in their toolbox. Please come join us. Yes, and this also goes to our listeners in uh, Morgan and uh, Jefferson counties. They are they are more than welcome to attend the in-person events, also the uh, also the Zoom events. We have very active chapters in both those locales. Um, in fact, uh, you've probably had the new Miss West Virginia Carrington Childress on the show. Um, no, actually, we have not. You need you need to, and of course, her platform has to do with uh, children's literacy in West Virginia. But she is a read aloud volunteer. Uh, she attended one of uh, the trainings uh, conducted by Casey and me uh, a couple of years back. But this is her platform, and she absolutely lives it. So, yeah, we had Miss Virginia on, who's a Martinsburg mm -hmm. Katie Rose, but uh, mm -hmm. not Miss West Virginia. Yeah. If, yeah. if you have a, a contact for her, let me know. Bob, we'd love to put her on the program. Okay. She could read us a story while we're on the air. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That'd be nice, too. Is there a particular time of day? Like, you know, you've talked about the, the amount of time and, and that you'll do it each week setting up that pattern. But do, does it tend to happen more in the mornings? Or if someone is more available, say, after lunch, is that a good time? The teachers' schedules tend to change every year because I, I would have I would have the same teacher for seven or eight years in a row, and and it would be different dates or times. It's just depending on their entire, you know, schedule. Very nice. Any final thoughts? Anything else we need to get across? Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, bounce those dates off of you again if I have a chance. Sure. These are, the Zoom sessions are going to be Thursday, September seventh at four p.m. 
Friday, September 8th at 12.30, Thursday the 21st at 4, Friday the 22nd at 12.30, and those are by Zoom. You can go to readaloudwv.org slash calendar. You could also go to our chapter's Facebook page, Read Aloud West Virginia of Berkeley County. And uh, there'll be a link there. There'll be a QR code that you can scan, and that can get you to a position where you can just click on a link and pre-register for those events. Um, no pre-registration necessary for our two in-person events, Wednesday, September 13th at the Berkeley Senior Center at 10.30 a.m., Wednesday, September 27th at Tuscora Elementary School Library at 6 p.m. And Damon Wright asks, if you've been a volunteer in the past, do you have to go through any more training again? No, you don't. But please, if, you're, if you've been a reader in the past and haven't, haven't been in a classroom over the last couple of years, and we've got quite a few of those folks, uh, please um, you know, go to the Read Aloud West Virginia.org site. You'll find contact information for me and Casey, I believe, and, um, you know, just, just let us know you want back in, and we would be happy to find a classroom for you. And, Casey, how many volunteers do you need at this point? Well, Bob, we're, uh, you know, as we finished, Rob, as we finished last year, we are about half strength. I would say, um, Bob, and tell me if I'm shortchanging this, I'd say we could use 100 people. I agree. 100 people. Are, are there any schools that do not participate in Read Aloud? There are a couple who have uh, who have kind of fallen off in in recent years, but we're working with the principals to trying to get them back in. So, um, but we will make that uh, we'll make that information uh, available as uh, as we hear as more schools register. I would assume that most people would like to volunteer at the school nearby where they are, or that they have a child or grandchild in. So that'd be helpful. Good to see you again, Robert. Great being here. Casey, good to talk with you again. Thanks so much for the call. Hey, listen, thank you guys for having us on. And folks, be sure to come read to the kids. Good stuff. Good work you guys are doing.